This is Focus on Your Health. It's brought to you by Kingman Regional Medical Center in historic Kingman, Arizona. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week I'm coming to you from KRMC's Wallapai Mountain Campus. My guest is Valerie McMillan. She is the manager of laboratory services at KRMC. Hey, Valerie McMillan, welcome. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I want to tell you something to begin our conversation. You know, um, so I've been doing this program now for six years. Wow. Okay, six years. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's what I wanted to tell you. No, um, sometimes, so I'm always trying to speak with different doctors, nurses, patients, all kinds of people, just getting a sense of what's happening at KRMC. And some time ago, I thought, the lab, I don't know anything about the lab. Let me try that. Now, I have spoken with Dr. Swap and Dr. Bedke, both lots of fun. But I called the main lab number and I said, hey, I'm, here's who I am. I'm trying to, and it was like, we don't do that. Click. And I was like, ooh. Now it's like become a black box. I, yeah. I'm not. I'm not dissuaded. I'm that much more interested. So I've got you, and I want to talk about the lab and find <laughs> out. I've been. I'm interested to know what you do. And from our preliminary chat, you do a lot. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot. There's a lot. How many labs are there at KRMC? So we have one primary lab where all of the testing is performed. It actually has two locations. Since we're in the desert and we don't want to be down at any time, we need to get this testing out. We have duplicity in all of our analyzers, and we've had to grow with the community. So we've split the lab into two different primary locations right there on the main campus. And then we have our five external draw stations where we can process specimens or specimens can be dropped off to us and then brought to those main laboratories. You have duplicity in all your... Analyzers. And what does that mean? So in every department, there is some type of automation that is helping the scientist or the techs to perform the lab analysis. So in blood bank, there's a blood bank analyzer that is actually performing the blood typing, the cross matching. In chemistry, there's an analyzer that is running these analytes, telling you what kind of electrolyte levels you have, how your liver's performing. So this automation, there has to be two because there's maintenance and there's downtime when things go wrong or when things need fixed. And if you have a surgery or someone in the ED, you can't just say, oh, I'm down. You can't have your troponin or you can't have this critical lab value. Uh, you need to be able to, to report those things out. So it's very important that you have two of each thing. Okay. I, I, see, I'm already, I, this is very cool. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always wonder when people, with people who work around a lot of technology, and granted, mm -hmm. that's much of medicine, but some medicine is still fairly old school, right? Mm -hmm. You can yeah. just kind of check pulses and listen and talk and figure things out. Right. Some medicine is really complicated in terms of technology. And your opening salvo was over my head, so I think, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. But I, I'm I'm curious as to if we just had to go and do a medical mission. But you had to assemble some of your team and do a medical mission somewhere, mm -hmm. the outback, very little electricity, that kind of stuff. How many of your regular functions could you perform? The current state in the laboratory would suffer. <laughs> no electricity, no computers. Yeah. That would be tough for us. We are very highly advanced when it comes to that. Technology and automation has taken over so much of what we do in the lab. When it comes to things like tissues and biopsies, it's a lot more hands-on, but there's still the staining process, making a slide, putting it under a microscope to really help those diagnostic issues come to light. If you went back to when lab medicine first started, they, they came up with some creative ways to get you the same answer. But those ways have been outphased by higher sensitivity, higher specificity. So the testing we do right now is is very specific. And back in the day when they just had, literally there was one test where you took a toad and they would drop the serum from a patient on the toad's back and if it bubbled, they were pregnant. That's how we found out that women were pregnant before automation. This was a reliable test? Um, so I'm sure there was interfering substances and it was <laughs> not very specific, but that's they really found ways. Somebody somewhere said, hey, let's just drop this blood on this frog and see what happens. <laughs> so wow. they were really just performing these scientific methods to, to figure out what was wrong with patients. Not the best ideal now. Now that we have the technologies, we wouldn't want to do that, but we would suffer without our modern day technologies. For you and your staff, is that an aspect of, I mean, do you all have that in common where you're enthusiastic about the technology and, or do you have anybody who has sort of like a, a 
Terminator sort of um, fearful scenario. You know what I'm saying? Like the machines take over and we can't do it anymore. Yeah, we are all of the scientific brain. We really like to work on the analyzers. We like to do these analysis. Some are a little less tech savvy when it comes to computers and they could do without the computers. They would do paper method if they could all the time. But it really has to be ingrained in you to like what you do. Mm -hmm. It can be monotonous. You could almost train a monkey to go in and do the same thing over and over and over again. But it takes that specialized tech eye to really find out when things are not going as planned, when a patient is not in normal range, when there's something really metabolically wrong with the patient. It takes that special eye. So a lot of what we do as wellness panels and and these tests can come out in normal range and it's just easy breezy work. But then when we get that sick patient that needs help, it really takes you to go above and beyond to figure out what's going on. There are, you said there are two labs, but they're all under the same umbrella, correct? Right, pretty much, yes. Okay, and then you also have different draw stations. Did we cover where those are? No, so a lot of people don't know that we actually just opened a draw station at Wallapai Mountain Campus, where we are now. Mm -hmm. Um, You can have appointments for that, but most of it is walk-in. So it's a real convenience for the patient population on this side of town. It's a, a lot closer for some other areas. We have our primary care that's on Wallapai Mountain Road. It's primarily um, appointment only. But if you had a stat lab that you needed drawn and there was no appointments at that time, we'd fit you in. Then there's also Suite 109 that's behind the Wellness Center um, at the MPC building. And they are all walk-ins all day long. They open up at 7 a.m. We have a station that's behind the ER and it's just a window where you can come if you have um, radiologies also or pre-surgical workups. We'll see a lot of those patients come into us. And then we have Golden Valley. So our patients that are out in Golden Valley don't have to drive in town to get their basic lab work done. And appointment out there is preferred but not essential? Yep, preferred, but they will squeeze you in also. Uh-huh. And so when you go to the lab, is it is it basically just for a blood draw or are there other things going on? It doesn't have to be blood. It can be a urine sample if they're testing urine specimens or it can be a swab if you have a wound culture and your doctor wants to know why, why it's not healing or what the infection might be. We can do something along those lines that looks for more of a bacterial issue, but it can be a medley of stuff. Whatever the doctor is ordering on you, mm-hmm. we do it for him. How many employees are we talking for the, when we combine all the labs and the testing facilities? Total, there's 65. They're all the way from our patient care technicians, which are the phlebotomist, to lab outreach specialists that are in those draw station areas, to lab assistants that are spinning the blood, processing the blood, delivering it to the right departments, making sure the labels are correct, making sure that your diagnoses are in there. And then we have med lab techs that are the two-year degree and medical laboratory scientists that are the four-year degree, uh, microbiologists that look for the bacterias, and our histologist team, which is under Dr. Swap in the histology department, all the way up to our doctors, which are the pathologists. And all the work you do, you're working to to be sure that it maintains that gold standard of excellence in terms of all the procedures, all the cleanliness, right? All the... Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So our lab is CAP accredited. That's the College of American Pathologists, and it is the highest accreditation you can get in the laboratory. It really is the gold standard. They set all of the regulations for how you should be performing in your laboratory. So if you get sick in California and you go to a lab in Cali somewhere, you should get the same results as if you were here in Arizona or in Las Vegas, Florida. All the labs should operate exactly the same. So they make sure that we standardize everything and we are performing up to par. Is it uh, a difficult standard to maintain? Not difficult if you're doing it right. It is intensive. You have to really make sure that your competencies are on file, that your analyzers are really operating up to standard. You don't let anything outdate. You make sure that your maintenances are done. And you stay up with the times. You have to keep evolving with the test. If there's one test but somebody has developed a new methodology that's better, more sensitive, more specific, your lab needs to try to follow those trends and stay up on the times so that you can be resulting things out as best you can. And as the manager of laboratory services, it's your job to stay on top of all of that. Yes, we do do a lot of research. We have the vendors that kind of come and search us out like, hey, it's the latest and greatest in the market. We can do this for you. And we would see if it's something that our patient population would need, if it's something our physicians would be interested in. And then we would just set different analyzers against each other to see which one is really the best for us. 
And since we're not-for-profit, we'll keep in mind that we don't want to go crazy expensive if it's not necessary. So we'll play the market and see what's best for us financially and to treat our patients, too. This stuff has to be crazy expensive, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very crazy expensive. It does really help our patient outcomes, though. So the, the dollar amounts on these things are, are huge but necessary. Do you, at the same time, it sounds like you have to have a certain amount of healthy skepticism when there's a new invention, some new bit of technology, right? You don't necessarily want to jump on unless you know for sure that it's going to have its dividends. Absolutely. There there are things that might not be endemic to this area. We don't have a lot of parasitology that goes on here. So we don't have a lot of parasites nearby. It's not something where our patients come in and, and they have the, a lot of parasitic infections. So there are items out there on the market that will help you detect different parasites much faster than what a basic lab could do, but it's not something our patient population needs, so we would not throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at that. When you have a test that comes up with something potentially anomalous, do you have to send it somewhere else? Is that part of the process? Yeah, so we have troubleshooting that we would do. We would find out why we can't figure out what's going on with the patient. Um, our pathologists would get involved and they would see if we've ran everything in-house that we can. If we've exhausted our resources, then we partner with Mayo Medical Laboratories and we would send specimen to them and also let them know what our concerns are, what we're looking for, and then they would be our backup. It's time for a quick break on Focus on Your Health. We'll be back in a moment for more. Stick around. Support for the Arizona Community Radio Network is provided by Kingman Regional Medical Center. The Cancer Center at KRMC is now conducting clinical trials. These studies are designed to find new cancer treatments and improve quality of life for patients. For more information, call Lisa Pickering, Clinical Trials Coordinator, 263-3385. Welcome back to Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week my guest is Valerie McMillan. She's the manager of laboratory services at KRMC. Let's just look at a, a hypothetical blood draw. Let's say someone comes in for a blood draw. I'm interested in the process of, of how that sample is taken and then where it goes on, the, on its ride. So if they came into one of our outpatient locations, the very first thing that we're going to do is make sure there's a physician order and their insurance is all in place. They have a driver's license. We have to make sure they are who they say they are. And then we would order the test the physician wants. We would verify again that's who they are because it's very important these tests belong to these specific people. And then our phlebotomist or lab outreach specialist would draw the blood. So it's a venipuncture normally unless they have a port and they would draw the tubes necessary for the testing. So each test comes out of a different kind of tube that has a different preservative, and then it's shipped to the lab, usually chilled, not frozen. Um, refrigerator is fine. It's shipped to the lab, it's processed by the lab assistants. They spin it all down or pour it off, keep it a whole blood specimen, whatever the requirement is for that test. They deliver it to the department, and then the medical technologists take over and run all the analysis on it. Mm -hmm. And when they discover something, or maybe if they need a second opinion, and then it maybe go, goes up the chain to the MDs. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then they have some. Who's the one who makes it? They report to the original doctor who shares the information with the patient. Is that how it goes? Yes. So if they are not a KRMC affiliated doctor, they will get a fax when all the results are done and on the medical record. They'll get a fax of the completion. If they are a KRMC doctor, then they can log into Meditech, which is our new EMR system. We've been talking all about it. <laughs> yes. It's everybody's favorite word right now. Everyone eats, sleeps, dreams, Meditech. <laughs> so um, they can log on and see the result, which is also an added benefit for using KRMC laboratories, whether you come in as an outpatient or you're seeing your primary care physician. If you're getting surgery, if you are at urgent care, you have a linear medical record with us. So any lab work we do on you stays on your patient account and it will run all across all of your accounts. So they can see, well, no, this glucose is normal for this patient, or this white cell count is normal for this patient, or no, they were here in the ER in urgent care, and now this looks really bad. We need to address this. Right. So it just provides an overall better patient picture for the doctors. Yeah, and as I understand, there were, at some point, I don't know, there were like six different computer systems at work at yes. KRMC. Previous to Meditech, every area had their own 
favorite computer system, next gen, chart, max, HMED, Sorian. But now with it all being one, it's better patient safety. And again, it streamlines the process for our patients. And I was talking with Dr. William Gustin, who came in and yes, was working Dr. on the Gustin's Meditech great. implementation. Yeah, he, he was yeah. a great interview, too. And when he said that there were previously there were like six programs, <laughs> yeah. I said, how, how could this be? This is yeah. ridiculous. He said, no, you know what? It's common in hospitals across the country. It is. Everybody gets in their own little silo, mm-hmm. and they find the technical abilities that work best for their department and it's not usually what works best for nursing doesn't always work best for pharmacy doesn't work best for lab so right. they find their favorite and then they go with it yeah. yeah returning for a moment to our perspective blood draw the reality is some people get anxious about mm-hmm. having their blood taken and what do you do to to help navigate that so we've jumped on the adet bandwagon it has been proven that adet skills really help to do anxiety reducing and get the patient involved in their care. And what does that stand for? So the A is for acknowledgement. You walk in, you're going to say hi to your patient. You're going to let them know who you are. The I is for introducing. So you'll tell them, my name is Valerie. I'm your phlebotomist today. I'll be drawing your blood. The duration is is to tell them how long it's going to be. The doctor's ordered three tests on you. I have to draw two tubes. I'll be in and out of here in just about two minutes. We'll have you on your way. That way they know how long this is going to be. Some people have no idea. They avoid blood draws with all of their body. They don't want to come near the lab. <laughs> so mm-hmm. to give them a, a duration will really help them feel better. And then to talk about your experience. So... Whether you say you draw 50 patients a day or you've been doing this for 15 years, letting them know this is not my first time is always going to be an anxiety reducer for the patient. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then thanking them because they don't have to come to us. They don't have to come to KRMC. There are other options out there. For them to trust us enough to treat them is is thanking enough. We, we really need to make sure that they understand we appreciate them. So yeah. we go through the whole ADET spiel. We will ask questions like, do you have a preferred arm? You know, where do they usually get you? Anything to help a second stick. We don't want to ever try that a second time. So we want it to be a really fast, successful, painless encounter and then get them out of there so they can enjoy the day. You have, so all the labs fall, or the two labs fall under one big umbrella, but right. Some cases go to one and some cases go to the other. How is that divided? So the main lab has our blood bank department, our chemistry department, our urinalysis department, coagulation department, and hematology. That is all blood specimens that come in there besides the urine. And we take care of those in the core lab. We're connected by a tube station to the other lab. And that is microbiology, histology, and pathology. So micro deals more with the bugs on the swabs. Our flu swabs go over there, strep swabs, wound swabs. All of those fun things get plated, and then we will test the bacteria to find out which bacteria it is and which antibiotics it does or does not respond to. And pathology is more bones, tissues, biopsies, tumors. It gets out of the whole fluid industry. It gets more into those cells. And the tube system is kind of like they have at the bank, right? You can shoot samples back and forth. Around the clock. So anything that's collected in-house, that needs to get over there besides surgical specimens are tube through the tube station anything that is not easily retrievable or non-retrievable if you have a toe amputated we're not going to risk putting it in the tube station and it getting stuck somewhere or going to the wrong location so anything like that is actually hand delivered to the pathology department interesting (laughs) what is the travel time for the tube Do you know? Less than a minute. Really? So could we stick a microphone in there and see what it sounds like as it travels? Oh, yeah. It's loud. It's it's a huge suction, just like at the bank. And then it's going to go under the back parking lot, get rattled a little bit, and then drop through Uh the other tube station. But it's doable. And was it still operating when we had our 18 inches of snow? Uh, Yes, it was. Thankfully, so that we didn't have to truck back and forth. Yes, it was. That was great. So you and your team have, you work with some potentially dangerous substances, and I'm wondering what kind of safety measures you have in place to protect the the actual physicians and the people doing the testing. Yeah, the scary stuff does get sent down to us. So we get the MRSAs and possible anthrax exposures, and we get the TB cases that come down. So we have what we call PPE, which is our normal protective gear, and it's gloves and jackets at a minimum. They, all of the techs that are handling specimens, even if it's blood, even if it's urine from their grandmother, it has got to have gloves. We treat everything as if it's infectious because we just don't know yet. So gloves and lab coat, then we have face shields if we need to uncap a tube. We have splash shields, we have face guards, a couple of different items in the main lab that we can use. In micro and in histo, they also have 
uh, reverse air hoods so that if they are cutting open a biopsy that might have TB in it or something that has fungal spores, we are protecting that person because the air will not let those spores get out. So even things like C. diff, we make sure we do that under the hood in a controlled environment to minimize chance of infection. Every so many years you hear about somewhere in the world, Ebola yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, resurfacing. If you had a patient show up and get, I mean, stranger things have happened. Right. A patient right. shows up at the ER and says, mm -hmm. well, yeah, and by the way, I was in Ethiopia or something, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the process for something like that? So when Ebola came to light, we practiced and practiced with the entire hospital. They had where they put these big giant tents outside and we did this big evacuation and they did this decontamination. But normally you're not gonna know someone has Ebola until they test positive for it. So we would originally just treat the specimen as if it is contaminated. And then if our suspicions did come to light and the patient did have Ebola, then we would get tested for it afterwards. But we keep all of the same precautions in place. Yeah. If somebody comes in and they're a TB precaution, we will do droplet precautions. We'll put mask on. We'll get a little bit more intense, um, making sure the room is an ISO room. So you can't just come and go freely and cross contaminate the other patients. You have to put bigger gowns on and make sure that you're throwing everything away before you leave the room. So we do have a lot of precautions instilled in the hospital and things like that. We've talked about the uh, the in-house, the network here at KRMC, but for patients who are seeing doctors outside of KRMC, you can help them as well? Absolutely. So we have patients that come to us from Cleveland Clinic that have a script and they live here and they are monitoring some type of therapeutic drug or what their liver enzymes are doing, seeing how their bodies um any type of treatment that's going on, seeing how their body's reacting to that. So as long as there is a script with a true physician on it, we can do the testing. Well, Valerie, we the time has gone fast, and so I thank you. And we're getting toward the thank end. Thank you. Yeah, um, but I always love to ask. We keep it professional, and then there's this personal question that I, I love to ask. I, I like to talk to people about the work they do, and I, I'm always curious, what brought you here? What got you into this this line of work? May I ask? Is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. It's not as exciting as some people that have had like near-death experiences, but <laughs> I had my daughter, and I thought, I want a career that makes her proud. I don't want to work in retail anymore. I really want to do something that helps other people. Um, and I, I thought, let's give this nursing thing a shot. And I quickly realized it was not what I wanted to do. It's Nurses are a great, great profession and, a, and an asset to our hospital, but it wasn't something I wanted to do every day. Yeah. My hat goes off to the nurses. It's a very tough job. I wanted to assist in healing and I wanted to be a part of patient care and positive patient outcomes, but I just didn't want to be the front and center. So I actually went to my college to sign up for my prereqs and I saw a bunch of people sitting on a microscope and then under a hood plating some augers and, and it just looked super exciting to me. I stood in the window like a kid in a candy shop and just watched everything they were doing and I fell in love instantly. I didn't even know what the degree was called. I didn't know what they did in the hospital, but seeing them under the microscope and just seeing how the doctors really went to them and relied on them and the nursing staff asked them questions. It was like they were such an integral part, but nobody knew what they were doing. They were so secret and I loved that and I fell in love with it quickly. It only took my first two years, I got my first degree in the medical laboratory sciences and I was hooked. I loved it. When you think ahead of you know what may come along in terms of laboratory sciences, you know, you're there on the cutting edge with all this technology. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What is what is ahead? What, How will the practice look 10, 15, 20 years from now? It's advancing really rapidly. So the equipment keeps getting better. The testing keeps getting more accurate. We have a lot of preventative things now coming out to where we can diagnose you earlier, diagnose you sooner. And a lot of the stem cell research is coming out. They have things with clones coming out. Genetics is huge and exploding right now. I'm not sure that that would really be in the basic hospital laboratory per se, um, but eventually we're gonna have to move that way to where all of our testing is that highest complexity to get the earliest best outcomes. And, and that's great, that's where we should go. It's, it's gonna mean longer life, better life, and, and helping these patients live to their fullest for sure. That is Valerie McMillan. She is the manager of laboratory services at KRMC. 
Valerie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. And that is the show. That's Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time. Sometimes I ask people if they would like to recite a poem. No. (laughs) 